So let's start off for a lay audience that has never heard of this concept, novelty search. How do you open this this very complicated idea up to people that it's a totally new idea? <clears throat> sure. So novelty search is uh, actually the name of an algorithm, um, but I don't want that to be distracting. So algorithm and computer science and stuff like that, because the interesting about this algorithm, whereas most algorithms are kind of obscure things that only people working in computers would think about, this algorithm actually had implications for like how you might live your life or how we might think about changing things the way that we do things in society. Um, and that's what's I think unique about it and probably why, why, why you're thinking this could be a, this could be an interesting show. Um, and so novelty search was about a realization that we had, um, which we, we, we found out because of doing experiments with, it, with certain kinds of algorithms, that sometimes the best way to achieve something is to not be trying to achieve it. So I guess that takes a little bit to digest. So just to say that again, like sometimes like it's better to actually not be trying to achieve the thing that you ultimately hope to achieve if you want to achieve it. Um, and so this is a very counterintuitive thing. It almost sounds like Zen or something like that. Um, but we found it to be true in um, a lot of experiments at first with computers. Um, and later we saw how this connects to um, actually uh, doing things in the real world. Um, but to, to actually connect it to the, to the computer experiments, just to make a, a brief introduction of what it actually is about, it basically is saying, what we're gonna do, since we're not gonna actually try to do something specific, instead, we're gonna just try to do something new or novel, which is why it's called novelty search. Um, and what we're going to always be trying to do every step of the way is to try to get more different from what we've done before than we are right now. And what this should do then is it should lead to us making discoveries of things, things that we wouldn't have realized are possible um, if we had just been trying to move directly towards some objective. And the funny thing is, often we might fail if we tried to move towards a specific, specific objective because it might be really complicated and hard. But if we were doing novelty search, we actually might end up solving some problems. Maybe they're problems we didn't expect to solve, but that we would not have been able to solve if we were trying to solve them. Yeah, it's one of those things that when you start to break it apart, at first you're like, well, then how can you use this to get anything done? Because mm. if I don't have an objective and I don't know what the other side of the river looks like, then yeah. what does that even mean for how I should move forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and that, that's a common question about this. Um, and so the first thing the, to answer that question I want to do is just clarify that we're talking about um, really ambitious, really blue sky types of achievement here. Like, how am I going to do something that has never been done before? So like when we're talking, if we were talking about more modest things, um, like I need to um, get breakfast this morning, like then this doesn't make any sense at all. Um, or even less modest than that, but something like I, we're going to upgrade this software to the next version. Like maybe for that, like that should be an objective and we'll just do it because we basically know what the steps are. Um, but if we're talking about things that no one has ever done before, then the problem is that we have no idea what the stepping stones are on the road to actually getting that thing done. And so it makes sense if you think about it, even though at first it sounds very counterintuitive, but it makes sense that because I don't know what the steps are that I need to go through to get to this very unusual endpoint, um, then maybe what I should be doing is finding stepping stones, like things that might actually be useful for getting somewhere new, rather than actually trying to get to this point because I actually have no idea, I have no roadmap towards how to get there. So when you think about those big blue sky ideas, like I, the some of the ones that were interesting from the book are like, how do you make a robot walk or how do you teach a robot to figure its way out of a maze? But mm -hmm. then how does that actually get applied? Right. So uh, those are examples where we actually ran this computer program or algorithm to try to solve those problems. Um, using this principle. So the program was actually not trying to make the robot walk. Instead, what it was doing was it was saying, okay, uh, here's a robot and I'm going to try to control it to do something it hasn't done before. And what was interesting was that even though the concept of walking is nowhere in that formulation, eventually it just stumbles onto the idea of walking anyway, because if it keeps on trying to do new things, eventually to continue to do new things, you have to actually start walking. And that's just to, to make a, a, 
a, a general statement about a more uh, a more general kind of principle, which isn't just about algorithms, which is that like many things are like this um, in life in general, and also in the history of discovery, like human discovery or human invention. So like one sort of getting away from like computer programs and teaching robots to do things like something, it's like a concrete example from history would be sort of like the invention of the computer. Like if you wanted to create a computer and it was the year like 1800 or something like that, like that would be, um, you have no idea what to do first. What should we do if we want to build a computer? Well, what's funny is that people were during that century actually playing with vacuum tubes and they were getting more and more sophisticated with those vacuum tubes. And, but they weren't doing it because they were trying to make a computer. They were interested in these vacuum tubes for totally independent reasons. And yet eventually it turned out that you needed vacuum tubes to build the first computer. So the thing that was needed to make the computer was built by people who were not trying to build computers. And this principle just, occurs over and over and over again in the history of invention and discovery. And in fact, what's interesting, even more crazy about this, if you really think about it, if we had gone back and found the vacuum tube scientists who were like looking at these vacuum tubes and exploring them, and we had said to them, you know, like, you're kind of wasting your intelligence here. Like, maybe what you should be doing is trying to build a computer. Like, why are you playing with these electrical experiments when we could be building this amazing thing that would like totally revolutionize the world? And if they had actually taken that up, we wouldn't have vacuum tubes, but then we wouldn't have computers either. So it was like, it was important for them not to be trying to build computers in order for us to eventually build computers, which is just a more um, real world kind of illustration of this principle. So I, when I read through your papers, you start talking about how this compares with evolution or co-evolution and these different concepts. And it's an interesting point because evolution when you when you backwards engineer it when you look at like hey where'd it go you say oh it looks like it was intending that the that you were going to get these biped you know um apes and then they would they would turn into humans but that's not yeah. actually the intention wasn't there it was like each evolution gave it some level of competitive advantage and then that competitive advantage then was allowed to uh flourish is that the same thing or how do you, how do you make that bridge? Yeah, there's, there's a really strong connection to evolution um, with this novelty search kind of thinking, um, which is this, the realization really is that these, these kinds of achievements that are like really blue sky kinds of achievements like a computer or something like that, um, they generally happen because of long chains of innovation that had nothing to do with that final discovery so like the vacuum tubes like they weren't people weren't seeking computers when they were seeking vacuum tubes and actually we see this uh principle in evolution maybe most starkly that the stepping stone organisms that led to some 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 of the most amazing discoveries like say the human brain or human intelligence there was no way that you could predict that this would lead to that and in fact the reason that this appeared had nothing to do with that final thing. So like to give a more specific example from evolution, there's, um, there's an ancestor of ours, which is very, very, very far back, but it's a flatworm. <clears throat> and in fact, I believe that the flatworm is the first time that we see bilateral symmetry, um, <clears throat> like in a lineage in, 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 in the tree of life. And so this is interesting because it, it appears like in hindsight that like you needed to get bilateral symmetry somehow to get to humans. So like you needed bilateral symmetry to get Shakespeare. But like if you were looking forward, that would be preposterous. You wouldn't say, well, we need to get bilateral symmetry. Like of all the things, maybe we should be administering a Q test or something, but not going for geometric symmetry. Like that doesn't make any sense. But the thing is, if we had thought that way and said, oh, well, well like maybe we were like a master breeder, like back in the, in, the, in the days of flatworms, we would just like kill off the flatworms. We'd be like, this has absolutely nothing to do with what we're interested in here. Um, and yet, so the reason, though, that the flatworms were preserved is because it didn't care about human intelligence at that time. It wasn't trying to do that. And in fact, that's kind of the explanation for why all of the amazing things in nature exist, because none of them were the goal which is a really interesting thing to think about because we do tend to think about processes of discovery as being goal oriented. But if you think about the greatest process discovery at all, which is probably the evolution of all of living nature, like this one run of something that produced everything that exists that's alive, 
Um, that was not trying to produce any single thing that ever actually came into existence. And that's actually the explanation for why they exist. Because if we were trying to produce any specific thing, then all the things that led to that thing we would have eliminated because there's no way we could predict that they actually lead to that thing. So it's very important basically keep an open mind. Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures. Yeah.